Today's episode of the Can Be Now podcast is brought to you by Gustafson Insurance. Business, home, and auto insurance made simple. For a free quote, call 503-266-2216. This tax exemption eludes me like a, a gazelle eludes an arthritic cat. Why can't can be people keep track of their dogs? Like, what is... <laughs> <laughs> to do that, you can't be stupid with guns. Yeah. Just that the board is saying they want to make can be schools great again. <laughs> it feels like we've been doing this interview for years. Just- Inside of me was screaming. <laughs> <laughs> you run for school board, you win or you die. <laughs> There's no second place. <laughs> Welcome to the Can Be Now podcast. We are the best and easiest way to stay connected to what's happening in your hometown. I'm Tyler Frankie. I'm James Walton. I'm Joyce Struby. And I'm Tyler Clausen. Um, James, Joy, are, are you guys going to read the stories Frankie sent you? Look. I don't know what's going on, but ever since the birth of, what, Frankie's, I don't know, sixth or eighth baby boy, ugh, ugh, it's like nothing. It's like he's abandoned this whole project to be, like, with his family. Those are the texts I keep getting. Can't make it tonight, guys. Sorry. Baby duty. And so I'm he like, didn't He didn't even write the stories? No, like, we got nothing. Like, where are his priorities? It's ridiculous. So we've got a Cambie Now podcast yeah. with no Cambie now no right now there's no camby yeah and i've been out i've been out and around like i know there's stuff going on but do i have that information i do not the you good did, listeners you of this take, show like, photos are on your being phone? let down oh, it's an goodness. absolute disaster joy do you know what's going on no nothing a well of information obviously from joy Boom! Always. <laughs> <laughs> okay what was that hey it's me frankie i'm back Oh, okay. Did you I made scare, it. Did I scare you guys? Uh, you I mean, you were kind of there. <laughs> <laughs> I scared Ellie. Nice. So, yeah, we are doing something a little different tonight because it's Halloween. It's Halloween. I, yeah. I synced up with you. I said it at the you same did. time. That was yeah. great. We're yeah. like this. Yeah. People we can't are, see what we're we doing. We are all sitting right here in the studio right now. Yeah. Joy, who is chatty as, as ever. Always. <laughs> <laughs> James, who is as forgiving as ever, right? <laughs> couple of uh, couple of friends who we don't give microphones to. No, they, sorry, ladies, we don't have enough microphones for everybody. <laughs> and some children. And some children. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's just a big Halloween, happy Canby Now family. So, Frankie, um, what are we doing tonight? Okay. So today, listeners, hang on. <laughs> so today. We're, we're just doing no news. Just like you guys said when you were kind of making fun of me and that was hard to listen to. <laughs> we are doing first-hand accounts that have been sent in to us from Canby residents of things that they have experienced here in town or in other places. And we're going to be reading them. We've got some cool local talent from the high school reading them as well. And it's going to be people's real-life experiences with the spooky and the paranormal and maybe even Bigfoot or two. <laughs> I'm already Ooh. feeling uncomfortable. Nice, <laughs> nice. James might need to leave. Joy, right. you ready to read some uh, s- some scary stories? Yes. I think so somebody, chatty. Like, Please, just I, keep it down over there. I think somebody there. might need to hold James' hand <laughs> through some of this. So. Yeah, James, you got the scariest ones, I think. Uh, I am genuinely disturbed by what I'm about to read. Now, we, we have special guests, too. Do you want to explain who those who they are? Yeah, so we, I already sort of did, but uh, the Canby High School students from the theater troupe Mm -hmm. are going to be reading some. I thought you were going to give like a list of names or something. Oh, okay. Give them a shout out, but no, it's fine. We, they, just the whole group helped. Yeah, no, I mean, I could have if you had like given me any warning. You're the one doing the intro. (laughs) (laughs) Um, They're going to be in the show notes. Cool. Look them up if you like their voices and how they read stuff. So let's just jump into it. Let's do it. There are a lot of stories about Baker Prairie Cemetery. I live next door, and I can tell you that they are all true. I've heard the children playing there. They are very active around 1 in the morning. I've heard giggling, laughing, even a little baby crying. I've also heard singing, although I can't make out the song. 
My dog often tries to go to the back of the house and alerts me to the sounds whenever we walk by. One night, we decided to take a video camera to the cemetery and try to catch something on film. I had done some research and had read that spirits carry a lot of energy. See, when we die, energy is matter, and matter cannot be destroyed. The articles on the internet said to charge your camera up fully as the battery would get sucked out right away if there was any legitimate activity. My brother-in-law, who was very skeptical, charged up over 60 hours worth of battery on the camera. We also brought a regular camera to take pictures and a digital recorder for audio. So, needless to say, we were prepared. We felt ready for anything. My two sisters, my daughter and I, headed down to the cemetery at dusk, and as we walked around asking if there was anyone who wanted to talk to us and explain why they were so angry, my daughter yelled out, Look! There are little kids playing in a tree right there! We all turned to look, and what I saw appeared to be a man in a buckskin suit with a rifle leaning up against a tree, and he was smiling at us. Without a word, I started running towards the house. My sisters were yelling, Why are you running? But they followed me nonetheless. These were questions that could be answered later. We'd only been filming for five or ten minutes, but when we got back to the house, the battery was completely dead. My brother-in-law said that couldn't be possible, but it was. Most of the photos from that night didn't turn out, but we did get one that showed three glowing orbs in the middle of the cemetery and one that we took from the other side of the cemetery showed that same man in the pioneer-style clothing hanging out by the tree. On the digital recorder, we got audio of a woman saying the word, Bugs. This was recorded near a headstone of a woman named Mary who died at the age of 60. Near the arch, I recorded what sounded like a little boy saying, Daddy, she jumped! Sissy jumped! I never saw the video footage. My brother-in-law called me several days later and said that when he played the film, he couldn't see anything but he could hear a woman crying. He destroyed the recording. On the south coast of England is a very famous hotel called Mermaid Inn. It's supposed to be one of the most haunted places in the entire United Kingdom. Given its history, that would make sense. The current building is almost 600 years old, though its cellars date back to medieval times when it was a popular alehouse serving sailors who came through the Port of Rye. One room is said to have been the scene of a violent duel between two men in the 16th century. After fighting through some of the nearby rooms, one of the men was killed and thrown through a trap door into the dungeon below. In the 1700s, the inn became a stronghold of the notorious Hawkehurst Gang, a smuggling operation that was known for the brutal murder of several customs officers. Several of the inn's ghosts are related to the Hawkehurst Gang, including a maid who is killed by the gang because they believed she knew too much. Another ghost, said to be the wife of Hawkehurst gang founder George Gray, was cited so frequently in an old rocking chair in one of the rooms that the chair had to be removed from the premises. It was starting to hurt business. One of the inn's rooms, number 17, is named after Thomas Kingsmill, who became the leader of the Hawkehurst gang before he was executed for his crimes in 1749. His body was delivered to the Sheriff of Kent so it could be hung up in chains as a warning to the other would-be smugglers. The King's Mill Room is where we stayed, as a special treat for my 60th birthday. We did not ask for details because we didn't want our experiences to be tainted by expectations, but we asked for a room known to be haunted. When we opened the door to our room, we noticed that it was absolutely freezing. A bitter, cold freezing. It was like opening the door to a walk-in freezer. I decided to tell the front desk, but when we went down to dinner, we forgot. When we returned to our room, it was warm and cozy, even though the radiator had never turned on. We found out later that the room is known for freezing cold episodes. We also captured dozens of orbs on video flying about the room. Before we left, I asked the owner if she had ever seen ghosts in the hotel. She said, no, but I've seen very many frightened guests.
I don't know why you would decide to stay in that room, but, you know, teach is on. <laughs> in late winter 2018, I was driving towards Cambio on Max Brooks Road. I was coming home from a basketball game on Colton, from, at Colton High School, so it was around 10.30. I had just turned off to 2.13 and I was driving with my window down since it was a nice night at the end of winter. There's a sharp left turn on Maxburg's, Maxburg where you need to slow down about 15 to 20 miles per hour to navigate it safely. So I slowed to enter, enter the turn and noticed a light in the sky to my left and that, and noticed a light in the sky to my left that I thought was a low flying helicopter. But helicopters are quite loud and I couldn't hear a sound. The night was completely silent. I recall the light being slightly yellow in hue, sort of like in Incon incandescent light, slightly yellow in hue, s s like a incandescent light. It wasn't blindingly bright, but I also remember it being bright enough that I couldn't make out the shape of the object that it was assumably attached to. Suddenly, the light s sped off into the distance at a very high speed. Not unrealistically fast, but like it was already at top speed despite just taking off. I can't necessarily say I believe in UFOs in the traditional Hollywood sense, however, and I can't say that I necessarily believe in UFOs in the traditional Hollywood sense, however, what I saw was quite literally a UFO simply for the fact it was unidentified. I think people tend to associate I think people tend to associate UFOs with aliens and extraterrestrial aircraft when that isn't necessarily the case. Just because we don't know what an object is in the sky doesn't mean it's an alien or from another world, but I do believe it is silly to claim that Earth is the only planet in the universe that sustains life. There is an infinite number of galaxies and solar systems among a number of universes there is an infinite number of galaxies and solar systems among a number of universes that is so big the human mind can't even comprehend it. I'm not saying there I'm not saying there's life out there as it's been portrayed in the movies, but I do think there is some sort of single celled or molecular organism that is there waiting to go through the process of evolution as we as we have. We even recently discovered ancient traces of water on Mars in our own solar system and water is the building block of life. But who knows, maybe there is life similar to us out there. After all, time is relative and it's in other universes or galaxy, the day to us could be a million years to them. Maybe they don't comprehend time like we do. The laws of physics could be completely different than ours. They could be so much more advanced than we are and we would not have a clue at all. I can't say I've ever had an experience like that before or since. Honestly, I didn't make much of it. I was a little perplexed, but I wasn't terrified or anything like that. It happened pretty quickly, over the span of about four to five seconds, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to think about the situation but that, or what was happening until it was over and I could process it all. But. It sort of felt like whatever saw me on the road decided it didn't want to be there anymore and took off. Who knows, maybe it was a helicopter and I was imagining things, but I'll never forget it. I once worked at a care facility in town. I'd rather not say the name, but we had a resident who lived there with us. I had been working there probably about three months when she passed away. She was well liked by the staff and the other residents and staff, so a lot of us took it kind of hard, even though you do get used to losing people in this field. It sort of goes with the territory, you know? Anyway, a couple weeks later, I was sitting in the kitchen area with another girl. We were doing our paperwork and getting ready to do our next rounds. There was a TV on the wall that would cycle through different surveillance cameras. We had cameras through the whole building. We weren't really paying attention to it because we knew everybody was in bed. 
except when I looked up at the screen that night, there was a woman. She was just standing there at the end of the hallway, down by the room where the resident had just passed away. And this woman was wearing a long white nightgown, just like what she had worn the night she died. The screen changed to a different camera, and when it cycled back through to, through to that hallway, the woman was gone. It was almost like I had imagined it, but I know I didn't. Working as a caregiver, you do see and feel and have a lot of paranormal experiences because the elderly clients are usually, especially those suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia, they don't know exactly where they belong or where they're supposed to go. Eventually, they find their way. I guess we all do. Anyone who grew up in this area or has lived here for a while has heard the stories. The legends that there is something in these woods besides bears and deer and mountain lions. Something big. I haven't seen the creature, but my wife and kids did. It was late summer of 93. We lost our apartment in southeast Portland and moved up to camp in the Malala River for a few months with our five kids ages 12 to 2. We had a 74 Ford station wagon and a very large tent which we all slept in. The BLM guy told us about a place where we could stay high up in the Foundation Forest Service Camp area. He didn't mind us there because we pulled tons of trash out of the river. It wasn't long before we started to hear the sounds. Loud, strange screams in the middle of the night from way up on the southeast ridge. Sometime soon after that, a Bigfoot investigation crew pulled in and asked us about it. They showed us a fuzzy picture that they said was of a Bigfoot living right in the same area that we were in. It just looked like a shadow to me. We told them about the screams and eventually they left us alone. Within the next couple of weeks, we had a few things happen. Heavy footfalls outside our tent at night, and the stench when we heard them was like vomit, feces, and dead deer, all mixed together. Then we found a track in a mud hole just above the river. The footprint was like 15 and a half inches long. One day, I decided to take a leak over by some bushes, and I knew there was another trail just behind it, like maybe 10 feet, but it was so thick that you couldn't see through it. I unzipped, but then I heard a very low, but very deep growl that went right through me. I could feel it vibrating in my chest, a deep primal fear like I had never experienced before. Needless to say, I didn't have to go anymore. I turned around and made it back into camp as fast as I could. Eventually, I got a job doing union construction, so I would head to town each day and pick up supplies we needed after work. It was during this time that they saw it. It was kind of funny. After all the mysterious sounds and smells, the screams in the middle of the night, the strange footfalls, the growls from deep in the underbrush, the creature just waltzed right into our camp one day like they owned the place. It stopped about 30 feet away and just stood there watching them. My wife said it was probably there for only about 20 seconds, but it felt like forever. Everyone saw it, though the two-year-old was too small to notice anything. The 12-year-old tried to give it an apple, but my wife stopped her, thankfully. The nine-year-old ran and hid in terror, but the seven-year-old was curious. The four-year-old was probably the most excited. When I came home that night, he kept saying, BB gun, shoot, Bigfoot, Bigfoot, BB gun, shoot. I laughed and told him, no, we don't want to shoot Bigfoot. We went outside and took some measurements where the Bigfoot had stopped. It came to be about seven and a half feet tall. My wife thought it was a female and maybe not fully grown. She said it didn't seem aggressive at all, just curious. We thought later that night that it might have been curious about all the kids. We were up at that spot for like six weeks or more. Finally, we got an opportunity to move in with some family members in Eastern Oregon. I'm 48 years old now. For the first time, I'm trying to process some of these earlier experiences, and I'm finding they can be hard to shake. 
I still get a little jumpy when I go outside to smoke at night, even though I know nothing is in the area. Even just yesterday, I was out in the woods on the west side of Fort Klamath, checking out a fishing spot just before opening day. I felt like something was watching me and got creeped out bad, really bad. I made a quick retreat to the car and hightailed it back to civilization. Could have been nothing. Scratch that. It probably was nothing. I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything. It was just this feeling like, wow, I need to leave now. The feeling didn't go away until I left the forest. So I'm here with Derek Hill, president of Advantage Mortgage in Canby. I was wondering what's going on in the mortgage industry right now. The mortgage industry is on fire right now. The big thing that's really exciting for us is that we are now an independent mortgage broker, which means that we can offer substantially lower rates and lower fees for our customers. For example, we just got a loan last week and the realtor said, hey, I think you should go talk to Derek at Advantage Mortgage. And sure enough, we got the borrower three quarters better rate and we saved them 14 grand in fees. Cool. So where, where can people find you? So office number is 503-266-5800 or they can find us on the web at findtheadvantage.com. But most people just give us a holler or they stop in. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, bet. Advantage Mortgage, NMLS number 1770599. Derek Hills, NMLS number 50183. Equal housing opportunity. Hey, Tyler, did you know that the world has changed in the past 20 years? No way! Yep, it's true. The way people shop for goods and services has completely changed since this thing called the Internet started catching on. Yeah, I've, I've heard of it. And yet some realtors still offer the same old services in the same old ways and for the same old percentages. Victory Point Property Group in Canby believes this time the real estate business caught up with the times. They'll meet with you for free, explain every step of the process, give you a clear game plan, and even let you choose the listing commission. Really? They they let you choose their commission? Really? Victory Point Property Group understands this is one of the biggest and most exciting decisions of your life, and they'll do everything they can to make sure you handle it like a rock star. Wow, that sounds great. I'm going to check them out by calling 503-263-4700 or by visiting online at victorypointhomes.com. You do that. Victory Point Property Group, real estate reimagined. There's a legend of a yellow Volkswagen that haunts the highways of Malaysia between Kuala Lumpur and Karak. The vintage Beetle is said to target lonely drivers late at night, coming up from behind them at reckless speeds, passing them, changing lanes, and then slowing down as soon as they get in front. Sometimes the Beetle will attempt to ram its targets. Other times, it is said that it will actually overtake another car, pull a 180, and start driving in reverse, nose to nose with its target. Okay, so what, right? So there's a psycho driver in Malaysia with severe case of road rage? We have plenty of those here, as anyone who has driven I-5 through Portland could attest. Well, the thing is, and this is consistent in all the reports about this mysterious car, is that any time a witness gets a good look through the front window of the Volkswagen Bug, they notice something very particular about the driver. There isn't one. The car is also said to vanish and reappear in impossible ways. In Malaysia, the yellow Volkswagen is believed to be a bad omen, a harbinger of tragedy to come. Many who have seen it suffered ill fortune on the road shortly after the encounter. They may break down or crash. Some have even been involved in fatal accidents. Many years ago, I had an experience with a similar phantom vehicle. I was 19 and working as a secretary for the Arizona JCs. I had to go to the National Convention, which is in San Diego, and since I had no air conditioning, I left very early in the morning before it got too hot. It was near Yuma, not far from the Mexico border, that I saw it. A yellow Volkswagen coming up fast behind me. It was so close that I couldn't see the bumper of the car. Of course, I freaked out. I may have even said a few obscenities. I scanned the road ahead to see if there were any other drivers, or better yet, a police officer, to witness this aggressive behavior. But when I looked back in my rearview mirror, my throat went dry as a Sonoran desert that surrounded me. 
the Volkswagen was gone. It hadn't turned off. There was no road for it to turn off on. And it certainly wasn't hot-footing it across the desert, which would have left a sand cloud that could be seen for miles. That's the thing about this part of the country. As anyone who's been there knows, it's flat, empty, wide open, nowhere to hide. No way that a car could just vanish like that. But that's exactly what it did. It all happened so fast. I didn't even notice if the car had a driver or not. I was just so put off by the tailgating. But I have wondered about that a lot over the years. I don't think I'll ever forget it. So, drive safely, people. And should you ever see a vintage yellow Volkswagen Beetle getting a little too close for comfort in your rearview mirror, well, you might just want to drive a little faster. It was late fall in 1978. I woke up about two in the morning when our horses suddenly became very agitated and noisy. Figuring a bear may be prowling about, my son and I grabbed our flashlights and our thirty thirty, and we hustled off to investigate this noise. By then the horses were so worked up I was afraid they might hurt themselves. We had never seen them act this way before, so we knew there was something up. I began to fear the bear had gotten into the corral somehow, and that's what had gotten them so upset. When we made it out to the corral, the bear, or whatever it was, went crashing off into the brush. We could hear its retreat. It sounded huge. The horses were terrorized and almost completely out of control. To our amazement, a seven-inch diameter tree, which had served as one of the posts of our corral, had been snapped and bent over. I suppose that a bear would be strong enough to do this. But why would it? We shone our lights into the woods where the thing had gone. But we were not about to go tracking off into the dense woods at that time of night. While the horses were still calming down, we decided to examine the broken tree a little more closely. This is when I came to know a fear that I would not have thought possible. There were footprints all around the base of the tree. They were not bare footprints. The realization slowly dawned on us that these footprints were very large and very human-like. As the unthinkable became obvious, I felt a tingling wave sweep over me. There was a strange unrealness in the air. I felt numb and detached from my own body, as though I was really not there but merely observing from a distance. I could not accept what I knew was true. The prints were deeply imprinted into the soil. They were at least fourteen inches long and ended with five very human-looking toe prints. This is the first time I have ever talked about this incident. I sold the property soon after. I was never comfortable there after that night, always feeling like I was being watched. To this day, I still suffer nightmares where I hear panicked horses and awaken to the vivid sight of those footprints lit in the flash of a lightning bolt. I have always been an avid and capable woodsman and hunter. I know game and all the ways of wildlife. There was something that I cannot explain. You can use this as you wish. I am now 67 years old and I think the story should get out. Only my son and I know what really happened that night. We agreed to tell my wife and daughter it was a bear and that we wiped out the prince. But we do wish to remain anonymous as we feel our credibility in the area would be damaged. We are a prominent name around here and are one of the largest landowners in the county. On March 13th, 1997, lights appeared in the skies over Phoenix, Arizona. Most of these UFOs are seen by one or two people. An old couple who probably needed to get their prescriptions checked, or some guy who probably had too much to drink, or smoked the night anyway. In other words, they're easy to explain away. But the Phoenix lights were different. They were seen by thousands. 
They described a triangular triangular formation. They described described a triangular triangular. That's hard to say in the voice. <laughs> um, they described a triangular shaped formation of lights moving across the night skies at an abnormal rate of speed. I saw something similar right here in the candy. I was in the backyard, trying to spot the comet Lovejoy. I was sitting in a zero gravity lawn chair with my binoculars steady at, steadied on the uh, with my binoculars steadied on the patio chair in front of me. I could see satellites and airplanes, but no comet. My girlfriend came outside to let me know when dinner was almost done, and that Obama was giving his speech about two years of free college. I shrugged her off and expressed my frustration about not being able to find this comet. Pointing out where I believed it was and where I was told it would be. I pointed out the star formation Pleiades and, the, and a satellite that was close by it. Then I started scanning the sky for more things I could point out to her. As I was gazing into the northwest, something caught my eye. I remember thinking, it's, it's a satellite. No, I remember thinking, it's a satellite. No. It's moving away too fast for that. Okay, shooting star. No. No. This is way too big for that. This is huge. Okay, what is that? I started screaming to my girlfriend. Come here, look, look, look! I was seeing five lights in a V-shaped pattern, closely followed by six or seven lights of the same frequency and size. Exactly what many of the Phoenix Lights witnesses described. The V-shape was one single large object, dark enough to see through the clouds and blocking starlight as it passed. It was amazing and short-lived. It was moving so fast. I just remember my jaw hanging open like, man, I can't believe I was actually seeing this. I couldn't really make out what the other lights were. They weren't as clear as the V-shaped object. Just lights traveling at the same pace, not far behind. When I had gone out of sight, I turned to my girlfriend and asked, Did you see it? Did you see it? Her reply was such a letdown. What? It? The shooting star? Her eyes weren't adjusted to the night sky, and she had only seen one of the lights. I stood outside for a long time waiting, watching for anything. I would have given anything to see just one more glimpse, but nothing. I went outside, got online, expecting this to be all over the internet. Others had to have seen it, right? Surely others had to be out there, looking for the same stupid comet I had been looking for. But there was nothing. Unlike with the Phoenix Lights, there was no one else who reported seeing what I saw. I blame Obama. There are stories from all over the world that tell of evil and inhuman spirits masquerading as man's best friend. They call them hellhounds. Sometimes these creatures, or spirits, or whatever they are, are only messengers, silent omens that foreshadow an unpleasant event. Sometimes they are something worse. My hubby and I used to rent a house on Fifth Street in Canby. Fifth is one of Canby's original streets and some of the houses there are over a hundred years old. We had only been there a few days, and I went out back to work in the yard. Much to my surprise, I found what looked like a flat grave marker. No name or anything, but that's what it looked like. I can't really explain why this discovery disturbed me so much, but it did. I tried to ignore it and even said a small prayer that I was not being disrespectful, but I still felt strange about it. I never asked the landlord about it because I didn't want to sound stupid or crazy. Both my husband and I would hear muffled voices in the house. We didn't think anything of it. The houses on the street... Oh my word. You're fine. Okay, I'm going to start that paragraph. Both my husband and I would hear muffled voices in the house. We didn't think anything of it. The houses on the street are really close together, so we just figured we were hearing the neighbors. Then we started to hear other noises, scratches and whimpers, the strange sounds of things bumping and banging at odd hours, barks and growls in the middle of the night, just the neighbors again, right? 
except our neighbors didn't have dogs. Then one night, my hubby and I were having an argument. He was in the living room and I was in the kitchen. I yelled at him and almost before I got the sentence out of my mouth, the door from the kitchen to the laundry room slammed shut really hard and loud. I ran into the living room and told my husband we had to calm down right away. The last and final thing that made us decide to move was when I was fooling around with a camera. I went outside at night and started snapping a bunch of pictures. I came back inside and we were looking at the photos. There were a bunch of weird orbs. Also a strange white mist was in the pictures in front of the trees and bushes. Finally, we came across one that showed what could only be described as a demonic dog. I know this sounds nuts, but that's what it was. It was very clear, and seeing it made my mouth run dry. I'm not scared of dogs, but I could not look at that thing. It was like looking at death. We deleted it immediately. The house is still there, and people are living in it. We have not been by to ask if they are experiencing anything. Whoever they are, I sure hope they like dogs. I don't know if I believe in ghosts, but I think there's some part of us that lingers in this place after we've moved on. Call it spirit, call it energy, call it whatever you like, but it's real. My two youngest kids often stay over at my mother's house when I have to work late. My mother, I don't know what you would call it, but she's sort of an empath. She seems to have some kind of connection to the other side that most people don't have. I don't know, but my kids have had some strange experiences in that house. So my grandmother had this thing she used to do with my youngest daughter when she was little where she would stroke her hair. Well, one night my kids were at my mom's house. This was about three years after my grandma passed. My daughter was sitting on the bed and she felt someone stroking her hair, softly, gently, just like her grandma once had done, except there was no one else in the room. After that, my two youngest kids were playing together in the house. We had lost our beloved dog, Shelby, about six months before. Shelby was very sweet with the kids and she used to show affection by licking their hands. Both my kids said they felt Shelby licking their hands, even though they couldn't see anything. We had never gotten another dog. Finally, that same night, both of them were sitting in the living room when all of a sudden they noticed a strange man sitting in, in front of them. They both later described an old man, bald, with a big nose. It was my grandfather, a man they never had met before. So in one night, they saw their great-grandfather, their great-grandmother, and the dog that they used to have. I don't know. Maybe I believe in ghosts, after all. Are you a small business owner or maybe thinking of investing in yourself with your very own startup? Awesome! Now all you have to do is reach potential customers at a time when consumers have never been more fragmented, more distracted, or more difficult to reach. If that sounds hard, believe me. It is. That's why I make Frankie do it. <laughs> Carrie and her team at Promotional Strategies offer strategic, purposeful solutions to build your brand with lasting promotional items that make sense for you and your company. They are creative geniuses who will deliver advertisements that people actually thank you for and will use every day. We've tried other sellers, and we trust Carrie to provide high-quality branded items that we can be proud of. Find them at 695 Southeast 1st Avenue in Canby or online at ps266swag.com. You know, Halloween will be here before you know it. Heck, the decorations are already in the stores, so I've got a scary good deal for you. DirectLink is offering 50% off their blazing fast internet speeds now through All Hallows' Eve. Not only will you get a sweet candy corn of a deal, but every one of their broadband connections comes with unlimited data, free, and that's no trick. So switch to DirectLink to stream and surf as much as you like. Plus, take advantage of free Wi-Fi home networking for six months with free installation of commercial-grade Wi-Fi equipment that ensures your entire home has the strongest, most consistent signal in every room. Talk about a treat. Call 503-266-8111 or visit directlink.coop for blazing fast internet.
We moved to this house in the south part of town when I was 10 years old. I was the oldest of six children, so I had one small room to myself, and my four brothers shared the room next to mine. I'm not sure when I first started feeling like someone was in the room with me. Thinking back, I seem to remember feeling like they were always there. It was never a scary feeling. They just lived in my room with me. I guess I just sort of rolled with it. They were always under my bed for some reason, and occasionally I felt the presence of a dog. This dog's tail would poke me in the back and make me jump awake. I often thought it was a dream, but there were times I had experiences like this when I was wide awake. One night, I remember physically being punched. It was a hard fist punch right between my legs. It jarred me awake and was painful to the point that I felt that bruise for days. The weird thing is it never scared me or stopped me sleeping in the room. During the same time, I would often hear someone in the kitchen downstairs making tea. I heard the unmistakable sound of the lid being lifted and replaced on a china teapot and spoons dropping into cups. I knew that no one in my house would be down there in the middle of the night making tea, so again I just accepted them as ghosts in the house. As I got older and started staying out later, I would often come home and stay up in my room until late doing whatever teenagers do. I remember hearing a lady walk by the house with high heels that clicked loudly on the pavement. After hearing this a time or two, I would jump up to the window to try and catch a glimpse of who it was, but I never saw anyone. If I was awake at 2 a.m., I would hear those same footsteps every time. Even years later, after I had moved out but came back to visit my parents, I stayed up and found that the lady still walks by at 2 a.m. every night. My brothers and I never talked about ghosts while we lived in the house, but as adults, we started sharing stories. My older brother told me that he used to have the end of his bed picked up and dropped on a regular basis, and his blankets pulled. Another brother confirmed the tea-making rituals and the lady with the high heels. My parents never knew any of this was going on. One of the most fascinating figures of modern ufology was Roger Crevin Lear, a podiatric surgeon. Though he lived most of his life in Southern California, several of Dr. Lear's children have called Oregon home over the years, including one who lived right here in Canby. The Daily Mail. Its contents are often mundane, rarely exciting, and usually bills. Almost never does it bring something capable of altering the course of one's life, unless that is that the course of one's life can be altered by bills. But that's exactly what happened to Dr. Lear one day when he opened a series of x-ray images from two women living in different areas in Texas. One showed a strange object embedded in the left hand of 47-year-old Pat Perinello. Another showed two objects in the left big toe of a 52-year-old woman whose alias was Mary Jones. Finding the x-rays curious enough to warrant further investigation, Dr. Lear removed the objects on August 19, 1995. More patients soon followed, Dorothy O'Hara, 61, and Alice Levy, 40, both from different parts of California, underwent surgeries in May of 1996. In January 1997, another surgery produced a strange crystalline object from the foot of 37-year-old Lisha Davison. Over the next 20 years, Dr. Lear would conduct a total of 16 such surgeries, removing 17 similar objects from different patients who contacted him from around the country. Many of the operations were video recorded. They are, as you can probably imagine, quite graphic. The objects themselves, which Dr. Lear submitted to some of the world's top laboratories for further study, exhibited a number of bizarre and unexplainable anomalies. Metallurgical evaluations revealed unique isotopes and combinations of isotopes that don't naturally occur on Earth, although they are not dissimilar from the composition of meteorites. They emitted electromagnetic radio waves at several frequencies and had attached filaments that were highly reactive to magnets. They were metallic, but covered with what appeared to be a biological coating, like the Terminator people, the freaking Terminator. Most disturbing was the distinct lack of any signs of entry and the lack of an immune system response by the patients. As Dr. Lear himself would later write, how do you get something into the human body and not have the body react to it? You either have an inflammatory reaction or it's a full-blown uh, rejection reaction. 
You just don't get foreign material into the body and have the body just sit there and smile at it. But apparently, that's what happened in these cases. One particular patient led Dr. Lear to develop a startling theory. On May 30th, 1978, Tim and Janet Cullen were driving in Colorado when they noticed something strange in the sky. For a few minutes, they watched what they came to believe was a UFO. Then they went home. When they got there, they realized they had lost an hour of time. Years later, an x-ray of Tim Cullen's arm would reveal an unexplained piece of metal. The image was sent to Dr. Lear, who later extracted the 6 millimeter metallic object. Strangely, Dr. Lear found that it was attached to various nerve cells in the patient's arm in a way that no foreign, non-biological object should be. His theory? A non-human entity from somewhere else was implanting these devices into people to monitor us and genetic changes occurring within our bodies in much the same way that conservationists embed tracking devices into wild animals to study them from afar. After surviving several severe cases of shingles and diabetes, Dr. Lear appeared at the 2012 International UFO Congress and was quoted as saying, Although I went through a terrible time health-wise, for some reason, I'm still hanging around. And one of the reasons I'm hanging around is to wait for disclosure to come. Sadly, he died of a heart attack two years later, six days before his 79th birthday. And the disclosure he was waiting for? Well, I guess we're still waiting. Growing up, one of my best friends, Carlton, lived in this old farmhouse on Central Point Road. It's not there anymore. It burned down, but it was built in the 1800s. It had this old cattle barn on the property that was just as old as the house. Carlton always told us whenever we went over there, my house is haunted and the barn is haunted. And especially when we were younger, we all thought he was crazy, but that, like he was just trying to scare us. But throughout the years, everyone, every one of us in our group of friends had at least one experience there. Seeing people that weren't there and other crazy stuff like that. One night in particular, we were all out in a field down on Township Road probably a half mile from the house. I think we were in what, in the eighth grade. We were all hanging out and just doing teenager stuff. When we started walking back, we saw something really strange going on in the house. The lights in every window were flickering on and off and all over the house. We, we thought it was Carlton's brother Jay and his friends just messing with us, but then we saw Jay's Mustang wasn't in the driveway. There weren't any cars there, and from where we were in the field, we would have seen if anyone pulled in. The lights all shut off at once, and we were all close enough to see the windows at the front of the house. In the second story window, very clearly, the silhouette of a person was standing there. Carlton saw it first. Hey guys, can you see that? It looks like there's someone standing in my bedroom. We were like, yeah, that's weird. Must just be Jay. Some Somebody must have dropped him off or something. That's when the lights all started going crazy again. Another time, me and my buddy Tim were in the hallway upstairs waiting for Carl Carlton, who was out in the detached garage doing laundry. We were on the phone talking to these girls we'd met. Someone, we assumed it was Carlton, came up the stairs, walked by us, and went, went into the room without saying anything. Tim followed him and came back and, and said, hey, did you see Carlton j walk by just now? I said, yeah, he walked right by us. Tim shrugged. He's, he's not there. We went into the bedroom, we looked in the closet under the bed, thinking he was messing with us. There was no one there. A few minutes later, Carl Carlton showed up at the door. We said, dude, I think I just saw your ghost. He laughed and said, yeah, I bet you did. One night, we were all sleeping in the backyard between the house and the barn. We had this new friend, Bo, and he had moved here from Washington. He didn't believe us that the place was haunted, so we dared him to go up to the barn, up to the hayloft. He did. We could see him in the window of the hayloft, waving at us. Then he came out the doors, except 
At the same time, there was still somebody up in the hayloft walking around. We asked him if he had seen anybody else up in the hayloft with him. He said, I never made it to the hayloft. I couldn't figure out how to climb up. I saw what I believed to be a Sasquatch about five years ago. I was 16 and was volunteering as a counselor at a day camp on the Malala River. A friend and I went for a walk on the trails within the camp. We also brought our lunches, which we planned to eat later. We were on the outskirts of camp, very close to the river. We were in this kind of swampy area, about 60 feet or so from a muddy creek. We had just sat down to eat lunch when my friend realized he had left something back at camp that he needed. He left and I sat waiting for him on this big log. It was a pleasant place to sit, very quiet, because those were private trails that were only used by the camp. The ground was a thick carpet of pine needles and ferns. The woods were old and thick. I love how forests in Oregon are so green. Even the tree trunks are green because the moss grows thick on them. When the sun shines through, it's so green it almost hurts your eyes. My friend had been gone for at least seven minutes when I heard something in the woods to my left. I stood up to get a better look at it. What I observed was a massive, hairy man-like animal standing up, standing up next to a large cedar tree, about 50 feet away. It was at least eight feet tall. I was about five foot nine at the time, and it was far taller than me. It was also very wide and bulky looking. <laughs> the fur was thick and fairly long, maybe six inches, and reddish brown in color. It looked directly at me for a few seconds. We had solid eye contact. It had dark, expressive eyes and a disquietly human-looking face. It seemed to be shocked or surprised and was deciding what to do. It stepped to its right, my left, behind the large tree and immediately began to run away. I cannot see it run because the tree blocked my view, but I definitely heard it. It sounded very heavy and very powerful. It was snapping down branches as it ran, creating a lo lot of noise. I listened to it run away for maybe 10 seconds. Then I turned and hightailed it back to camp as fast as I could. I was freaking out and it took, and it took me a long time to calm down. I felt like I was losing my mind but I know what I saw. I've seen bears before, and this was no bear. This was something much stranger, and it's still out there. I used to do some work as a paranormal investigator, but I only ever really did one investigation in Canby, and I guess you could say one was enough. We were asked to investigate this apartment that was an old house in town. The family who lived there had been experiencing a lot of strange activity, particularly in the room of their two-and-a-half-year-old daughter. She would wake up at night screaming, Don't let the man get me, over and over. The dad, Justin, had called us, knowing that we had been a part of an investigation group the previous year. When we got there, the house seemed a bit off, but I didn't think too much of it. We went into the girls' room, me... Justin and my best friend's son, Tyler. Justin had the idea of using a flashlight to attempt conversation with the entity. He asked if it would communicate by turning the light on. Nothing happened. After a minute, I said, Look, I'm not trying to be disrespectful or get you to do parlor tricks, but I need some validation that you're here. Immediately, the flashlight came on. At that point, I left the room to breathe. I am at times quite sensitive to negative energy. I was standing outside when all of a sudden I hear those two screaming at the door. They were doing EVP work and the first rule in EVP is to be careful what you ask for. Tyler said, if you're really here, can you touch my arm or something? Then something slapped him on the leg. You can hear the slap very clearly on the recording. We attempted a smudging. This is a Native American tradition where you burn dried white sage while walking through the home. You fan the smoke into all corners of the house using a feather of an eagle or a hawk. Sage neutralizes negative energy, but in this case, it 
could only seem to infuriate it. Eventually, the family just moved out. To this day, I don't know what we encountered that night, but there was definitely something there. As far as I know, it's still there. I am not a golfer. I mean, I'm not a good golfer. So when I want to play a few rounds, I head over to Frontier Golf Course. They're a family-owned, family-friendly nine-hole course with beautiful scenery. And they let me rent clubs or bring my own. And they don't judge me for my slices and hacks. Or, you know, my language. Frontier Golf Course is a great place to meet your buddies and have a drink or bring your kids along. They're located on Holly Street just north of town. If you hit the ferry, you've gone too far. Also, please don't hit the ferry. <laughs> yeah, please don't. But do ask them about Farley the Goat. They love that. Frontier prides itself on being the best value course you'll find in the area. If you haven't been by in a while, you've got to come check out what the new owners have done. Frontier Golf Course. It's a new frontier. Right off the bat, I'll tell you, I'm a 16-year-old kid telling the absolute truth. And may God strike me dead if I'm lying. Let me explain my situation to you. I live, and have lived, on the Malala River for most of my life and never thought twice about walking around at night. Period. About two months ago, I was over at my grandma's house when I decided to go home. My house is about 50 yards away. As I was stepping outside, I was struck by the most hideous feeling of being alone, and fear started thumping in my heart. I kept walking in a state of object terror. Then, all of a sudden, I heard a loud thumping sound crash from the woods about 30 feet to my right. I started running faster than I've ever moved before, but I could swear I heard the distinct sound of a loud two-legged footsteps veering towards me from off the trail between the houses. Oh, you're great. <laughs> you're doing really well. I raced in my house, slammed the door, locked it, and sat in the living room to calm down from my strange experience. The oddest feelings flushed through me then, and they still do whenever I think about it. Now, before you dismiss my story as a frightened child running from scary noises, I'll have to tell you of the strange past of our 45 acres of land at the end of the Dickey Prairie Road has had. Around three years ago, when we had cattle fenced on our property, I noticed how they would always stay together and go near the barns at night. Then one day, we discovered two of them killed up in the woods by the drinking creek. These weren't your average killings either. The cows didn't have a scratch on them. Both of them had broken necks and their eyeballs sucked cleanly out. Ever since that night, there have been random occurrences of loud noises in the middle of the night. It sounds like something very big and very strong banging on the side of the house. We've never identified the source of these noises. When I was in fourth grade, our neighbors down the road, they had kids my age, were taking out the garbage when they reported seeing a giant white monkey walk up the hill and away from the trash cans. There have also been numerous tracks found around the area and many other incidences of strange noises reported on Goat Mountain. Too many to list here. Since these experiences, I'm now scared to go hiking and travel at night. I have the weird feeling of being an intruder. So that's my story. You can believe what you want. As for me, I'm a believer. My sister lived in a hundred-year-old house on Meridian Road. This house was a well-built, two-story home, but you could see just by looking at it that it was very, very old. My sister and her family loved to go to the beach, and whenever they were gone, my kids and I would go to her house and check on things. There had been a lot of odd happenings at this house. Once, my sister had been painting in a spare bedroom and called me and our other sister to come over right away. When we got there, she was sitting in a chair, staring at the floor, where two very obvious footprints were literally burned into the carpeting. There was also a tree in the backyard, where once in a while, if you turned the corner too quickly, you would see the figure of a woman hanging by her neck. If you blinked or glanced away, it would disappear. My last experience there happened late one afternoon 
when they were out of town. My daughter and I went over to feed her cats. I was standing in the kitchen, counting the number of cans of cat food, when I heard music, people talking and laughing and glasses clinking. I figured one of the kids had left a radio on before leaving for vacation, so I decided to run upstairs and turn it off. Now, the kids' bedrooms were located upstairs, just off the kitchen, in a setup that sort of was like an attic. Very cute and cozy by day, but creepy and ghostly at night. Her kids often said that at night it would sound like someone was moving furniture. This was chalked up to active imaginations at the time. The sun was setting as I opened the door to the stairwell, which was bordered by walls on either side. Most old houses don't have an open stairs plan, so you were squeezed in between two walls as you walked upstairs to their rooms. As soon as the doors opened, a rush of ice-cold air came rushing down the stairs. It knocked me backwards. Then every single thing went flying off the kitchen counter like an invisible arm had swept across it. I stood there in shock and suddenly realized the noise from upstairs was gone, replaced with an eerie silence. I ran outside and sat down on the hammock in their front yard, where I could see all the way into the kitchen. My daughter was standing there, around nine years old at the time, and I heard her saying, No, you get out! The hair stood up on my arms, and I started yelling for her to get out of the house, now! My daughter, being the stubborn soul she is, refused. She said she had to finish feeding the cats. She continued her back-and-forth discussion with someone, saying things like, Well, you don't live here anymore. My aunt does. And you're the one that's dead, not me. Stop bossing me around. She had zero fear. She also no longer has any memory of this event. Several months later, while everyone was away, the house caught fire and was so damaged that it later had to be destroyed. Guess where the fire originated? In the stairwell wall. I grew up in England, not Canby. There are lots of ghosts there. I lived with a ghost or two under my bed. Sometimes a dog would show up. I was even punched one night. I also had many encounters in a local pub with a well-known ghost who was basically one of the regulars. It was in the old carriage house that belonged to the manor home close by. Probably about 600 years old, but nothing unusual for England and the area I lived in. It had several rooms and the typical pub games, billiards, darts, a jukebox, and a new arcade game console. I think it was Pac-Man or tennis or something. A group of us walked to the pub one cold and windy evening for some fun. I made my way to the game machine and others wandered around, ordering drinks and finding tables. The game console was near the doors. There were two heavy wood and glass doors which led to into an inner entry with two more heavy wood doors that went to the pub. I was doing really well on the game and had lots of turns lined up. When I felt the inner doors open, letting in all this cold air, I shivered for a moment as whoever came through the doors walked over to me. Though I was focused on the game, I felt them standing close behind me and watching over my shoulder. I started chatting with them, distracted, while I finished up the round. I was excited because I had gotten a high score. I turned around to see who had witnessed my great achievement, but there was no one there. No one was even remotely close by. I had a closer look at the doors, and it was obvious there were they were far too heavy and to have been blown open by the wind. I was so freaked out by this encounter, I mentioned it to someone and found that the bar is said to be haunted by the ghost of a man who used to live in the carriage house. 
and take care of the horses. For fun and for proof, the bar would sprinkle powder on the floor at night after they closed. In the morning they would find footprints everywhere. I am always looking for ghosts, but I have never seen or felt one since I moved to the US 40 years ago. But my wife's ho old home in Beaverton was totally haunted. In all of Oregon, there may be no other building that has a darker history than that of the Fairview Hospital in Salem. I spent four days and three nights there in 1999, and I will never go back. Fairview was established in 1907 as the State Institution for the Feeble-Minded. The hospital opened on December 1st, 1908, with 39 patients transferred from the Oregon State Insane Asylum. In 1981, more than 1,300 Oregonians with developmental disabilities lived at the Fairview Training Center in Salem, where for decades they were known as, quote, inmates. Residents at Fairview tell stories of being disciplined with leather cuffs, razor straps, cow whips, and even put in isolation cages. Grown children at the ages of 11 or 12 still being kept in cribs all day. One resident described their experience. They were strict at Fairview. You got beat up, yelled at. They put us in closets. They used their shoes to spank us also, another said. If you don't behave yourself, they'd get you with the scalding hot water. More than 2,600 forced sterilizations took place at Fairview. Vasectomies, hysterectomies, tubal ligations, and even castrations were required of any patients who wanted to leave. This was official policy until late into the 1970s. Inhuman devices and methods were commonly used to restrain or control patients, including leather cuffs, helmets, straight jackets, and dangerously high doses of sedatives and psychotropic medications. In 1980, a graduate student who was assigned to work at Fairview described horrific tales of residents being handcuffed to 60-pound blocks and forced to push them up and down the hall. The American Journal of Forensic Medicine and Pathology found that between 1963 and 1987, residents of Fairview were more than twice as likely to die from unnatural causes as people in Marion County who were not institutionalized. The time I spent there was while I was working for a company that was helping five patients move into their own homes. But before that could happen, we, these assigned caregivers, had to learn how to care for them in their new homes. When we arrived, we met at the place we'd be staying, Pierce Cottage, a creepy, decaying facility that would burn to the ground in a suspicious fire ten years later. Inside, the paint was chipping off the old walls and the floors creaked. There was this lady who worked there who was giving us a tour and about a dozen of my co-workers. Something weird happened while she was talking. All of a sudden, her voice started to sound different, muffled, like, I, I, I know this is weird, but you know how adults sound in Charlie Brown? It, it was like that, muffled, like, like someone talking in a tunnel and moving further away. And then, then I couldn't hear her at all anymore. I, I heard something else. Children screaming, children begging and crying out for help. I ran out of there and I didn't come back for hours. Eventually, I did return, but our night of terror was just beginning. After dinner, we went to our assigned area to settle in. The whole place smelled of urine. It was horrible, and none of us would sleep on the beds because they had the leather straps on them that had once been used to hold the kids. We had all decided to sleep on the floor. This was the worst weekend ever. After a while, a few of us decided to explore the place a bit because none of us could sleep in that creepy old building. It was four stories tall. Most of the buildings at Fairview were like that. The top one was mostly just storage. The bottom three floors was where they kept the kids. Each of these floors basically had two playrooms and an office. On each side, there were two doors. We opened the first door, and there was nothing. And that made sense because the place hadn't been open to kids for 10 or 15 years. It was completely empty, cleared out. And then we opened the second door. The room was dark, but there was just enough light from the street lamps outside that we could see the floor was covered with kids' toys. And there was a TV. And as soon as we opened the door, it turned on by itself. After we saw the TV turn down, we ran downstairs. We did not want to deal with that. We wound up in the basement. Of all places, it was dark, and we couldn't get any of the lights to work, but our eyes slowly adjusted. The floor was kind of a rubbery, like a playground flooring. 
The walls were plain white, normal walls, I guess, except the top two feet or so was made out of this chicken wire. My coworker and I were in one corner, still trying to find the lights, and when we looked up and we saw six red glowing eyes staring at us from the chicken wire. To this day, we have no idea what they were or where they came from, but we got the F out of there. We made it back to our room and hunkered down for the night. We heard knocking. We heard footsteps. At one point, the furnace turned on and more kids screaming. Naturally, nobody slept. After we were done with our training the next day, we started asking questions of the staff. A lot of them had worked there for 20 plus years. We asked them if Fairview was haunted and they said with all the things that had happened there since 1908, they wouldn't be surprised if it was haunted or if somebody was there. They said they had seen quite a few things themselves. After that, they let us just go on our own, and we decided we wanted to go back to our cottage and just have a look around in the daytime. We found a little closet area, and you can tell there had been children in there because there were scratch marks on the door just about at waist height. There were still crayons on the floor. Why, how? There hadn't been kids in this facility for over 10 years. We have absolutely no idea. We found the washroom where the laundry machines used to be. My boss tried to walk up to one of the walls and, and something or someone pushed him out of the way. It was a hard shove that almost knocked him on his butt. I'd never seen anything like that before. He was so freaked out. It was an eventful four days, to say the least. I remember every once in a while, I would look around and I swear to God, I could see people standing in the ditches and standing on the buildings. One time I thought I saw somebody standing in Pierce Cottage. Like I said, that cottage burned down in 2010. There's a lot of speculation that it could have been one of the ghosts of Fairview that burned it down, but fortunately we found out later it was just some punk kid smoking pot. This place was really like watching most haunted or ghost adventures. It's closed to the public now. Not that I'm eager for another visit. You couldn't pay me enough to ever set one foot back into Fairview alone. My dad passed away this year. We knew it was coming, and he was ready for it, or as ready as a person can be. He went out on his own terms, in control. But still, it was hard. We were very close, and even though I tried my best to prepare for it, the pain and loss and grief hit me like a freight train. A few days after it happened, I was up late one night texting with my daughter. I was alone, downstairs in the living room, sitting in my favorite chair. I was very much still dealing with losing my dad, and I didn't want to go to bed yet. The nights were the hardest. But it was late, and I was exhausted. I dozed off with my phone lying on my chest. I don't know how long I was out. It may have just been a few minutes. What woke me up was a voice coming out of my phone. At first, I was afraid I had somehow called my daughter in my sleep. Sort of like a butt dial, but, you know, with my boobs. It wasn't a call, though. It was a voicemail that had started playing on its own. I recognized the voice instantly, and my heart started pounding. It was a voicemail from my dad, one I had never heard before. And this is what it said. Hi. I, I'm just trying... I, I'm just trying to figure out... When, when did I die? And, and, and when, when is the funeral? I don't have any of this information. Call me back. I want to know when I'm going to be buried. Bye. I was up the rest of the night, freaking out. I wasn't really scared or anything, almost just in shock. It was just so weird to hear his voice and to hear him talking about his death in the past tense like that. I know, it sounds crazy, but that's why I saved the voicemail, as proof. This really happened. You know, it's kind of funny because we used to joke around about this. He said that if it were possible, he would try to contact me from the other side. He said, oh, you better believe it. I'll find a way. And I said, well, you'd better make it obvious. None of this white feather floating in the breeze stuff. I really want to know for sure. Well, I guess now I know. <laughs> 